things, but uh, we're very excited to talk to Quentin uh, Tarantino next, of course, of uh, Grindhouse. And Jimmy and I saw the movie last night, and if he's listening in the green room, man, two huge thumbs up for Grindhouse. We'll get into that next. It's the Opie and Anthony Show. We're back with the Opie and Anthony Show. I want to get right into it. Quentin Tarantino in studio. Yeah. And during hey, the break, I went into I... the green room just to say hi, because we're all huge fans. That's That's an obvious thing, right? And then I find out that he listens to our show. He, he has XM oh, no. Satellite Radio. Yeah, I got XM. Oh, and no. <laughs> I listen to you guys. Not only that, I, I didn't even know that there was that best of channel that you're just on 24-7. Oh, yeah. I found that actually last week. <laughs> and that's when I knew you were a fan because uh, we'll have people come in, we'll interview them, and, and they'll go, hey, I, I love you guys. And then who was it recently? It was... Uh, Oh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Goldblum. Goldblum. Oh, uh, oh. And he's like, big fan. I'm like, well, just name one bit we've done. That's all. Just one lousy bit. And he couldn't come up. He was just okay, trying to I be can nice. Come, I can come up with the uh, the the, uh, the Louis Anderson on Family Feud bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> How cool is that? With my father <laughs> turning tragedy to comedy. See? That's, that is awesome. You just made our day. I, oh, you know, man. Who cares, about, yeah. who cares about Grindhouse? Quentin Tarantino's a fan of ours. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I was telling him in the green room, I'll say, in front of everyone, we went and saw Grindhouse uh, last night. Jimmy and I and his lovely uh, girlfriend. My girlfriend was uh, at school. Um, <laughs> nice. It's nice being a radio star. <laughs> and uh, and I told him that like I'm. It's it's tough for me to sit uh, for three hours in a movie theater, but I I had it was so easy to sit through. So what movie. everyone's saying is it it goes by so fast. It's not like you're sitting in a long movie. Well, you know, it's like well, you know, there's a difference between. Uh, and, uh, I kind of also don't have a problem with long movies, but there's a difference between sitting and watching some big movie that like takes three hours and watching like two movies. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. this whole like theatrical experience, and that's what we were trying to do. It's like, you know, there's Robert's movie Planetaire, there's my movie. Got to be so good that you could take those out and they cause it exist on their own. But but putting the trailers in there, it's we're trying to just give you like this experience of what it was like at the movie. So it's hopefully hopefully it's closer to like a ride. It, it definitely was. It's so it it, it must. That's that kind of thing reminds me of when I was a kid, mm-hmm. you know. And you'd go to the movies, and it was such an experience. And those trailers were bigger than life, yeah, and scary, and kind of like adult-oriented, titillating, you know. Oh God, no! I remember actually going. Um, one of the, the somebody asked me. I actually had to think about this. Uh, what was like the first Grindhouse movie I ever saw? You know what I officially call that. And and you actually just triggered something in my head right now. It was the Doberman Gang, and my grandmother took me to see it. And now the Doberman Gang was an exploitation movie, but like kids could see it. But the one that it was playing with was a movie called The Twilight People, which was like this Filipino uh, a horror film, sort of like an Island of Dr. Moreau, and Pam Grier was in it, and she nice. was like the Panther Girl. But it got me thinking that while I'm in the while I'm watching the movie with my grandmother, there was a bunch of trailers in the middle, and one of them was for one of my favorite women in prison movies, The Big Bird Cage, also with Pam Greer. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember it was like the, the women are fighting, and this is one of the first times I ever saw this in my life. Women were fighting, and all of a sudden Pam Greer throws this girl on the ground. The woman calls her a nigger, and Pam Greer steps on her face, and she goes, that's Miss Nigger to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic, too, and you're a kid watching something like that. I you feel like, like you're in on something oh, yeah. so adult. The yeah. big birdcage. I got to see that. Yeah. My uncle took me to a movie called uh, I Drink Your Blood. Yeah. And it was uh, these bikers come into town. And start hassling everybody. And these kids get this idea. They they, uh, find a dead rabid dog and take the blood out and shoot it into these pot pies and feed it to the bikers. And the whole movie is then rabid bikers coming after people. (laughs) Kind of like a zombie. Bikers with rabies. That that is actually a terrific movie. I can't believe you saw that when you were a little kid. Yeah, it was great, (laughs) man. My my crazy uncle took uh, took me to see it. That movie's out of control. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's sick as a kid, man, you know? And I love it. I was fascinated oh, by man, it. Oh, then that one shot when he's actually injecting the meat pie yeah. right, with the rabies. Yeah, and then they're foaming at the mouth, bikers just biting people. <laughs> Fantastic, man. Exploitation films. Uh, they went away, until, but you brought it back with this uh, this grindhouse, that's for sure. Well, it's one of those things where it's actually, I hadn't thought about it until like I was going my New York tour. You know, the movie will obviously be playing on 42nd Street, and I was like, holy hell, man, we're bringing 42nd Street back to 
Forty Second Street. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bringing a little scum to Forty Second Street. A little, yeah. a little, a little, bring a little skank we're, bag. We're, we're bringing a little, you know, uh, 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 pre Giuliani. All right, with Forty Second Street <laughs> yeah. going on there. It's amazing you're, to me. You almost thought Mayor Lindsay would be the ju- would be the mayor now. Oh, <laughs> it's amazing to me what you get out of actors too. Like when you see what Kurt Russell does in this, it's like you have this great knack of mm. taking actors where nobody else has seen them go, and and he plays a uh, stuntman Mike. Yeah. What a fantastic character <laughs> this is in this movie. And the thing with Kurt Russell, he used to do roles like that, but he hasn't for so long, and yeah. you brought that 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 wild side back. Well, you know, in, I, in Kurt Russell. Well, it's funny because you know some people are saying, "So is like, you doing this like uh, with Kurt Russell, like you do with John Travolta?" I go, well, you know, I don't know if Kurt Russell needs my help that much. Yeah, I'm yeah. Doing pretty good, but there is that aspect. I remember it was like I don't know. It, Sometime around when he did that movie, uh, Dreamer, that horse movie with Dakota Fanning, I'm opening up the newspaper and I see he has like a silhouette shot on Magic <laughs> Hour of Kurt Russell and Dakota Fanning and a horse just running. And I'm like, okay, when is Kurt Russell going to be a badass again? <laughs> yeah. I want Snake Plissken back. What's going on here? I'm McCready from The Thing. And then when I came up with the idea of Stuntman Mike and I wrote the character, then I just kind of thought of Kurt. And after I thought of him, I just couldn't. Couldn't put the monkey back in the box. It was like, that's the guy. It's mm-hmm. a great character. Great character. Well, the, the, movie, the whole, actually, the whole thing ended up being, uh, the whole Grindhouse experience ended up being kind of like this de facto tribute to John Carpenter because Robert's movie, to me, feels like the lost John Carpenter movie in between Escape from New York and The Thing. Yeah. And he was even, like, playing, like, Escape from New York music, like, during the uh, during the shoot and everything. So he would, like, shoot a scene and he'd show, he, he'd cut, he'd shoot a scene, then kind of do a quick cut on it and then show the actors. And then he would score it with like an iPod to escape from New York music. Wow. wow <laughs> so man. it actually felt like we were on a John Carpenter set the entire time. And then during in that environment, go, hey, what about Kurt Russell for Stuntman Mike? Yeah. I, and uh, we want to explain to people it's two, it's a double feature, and the two movies are drastically different. Yeah. Robert Rodriguez's mm-hmm. uh, Planet Terror is a zombie slasher film with a lot of blood and guts, and it's the whole movie's pretty much dark. And then your movie, I noticed, is it, most of it is uh, in, in the daylight, which, yeah. I, uh, which I thought was a nice twist. Oh, well, what, and a nice contrast to the first movie. Yeah, well, one of the things that we did, and also we were something we were conscious about, um, when they would, uh, when like a studio or these little exploitation studios would design these double features, if they were a horror double feature, oftentimes in the 70s, they would put like the more a more fantastical movie, like a monster movie or a werewolf or a vampire movie. With like a, a movie about a guy, you know, stalking babysitters or a guy killing nurses or something like that. So there was like a, a horror film and a terror film playing together. And that was what me and Robert were talking about was like, okay, Robert's film is a horror film because it couldn't happen. My film's a terror film because it could happen. <laughs> Absolutely could happen. My father took me to see a double feature one time in the movie, in, in the drive-in, and I forget what the first one was, but the second one was The Sensuous Nurse with Ursula Andress. Oh, he, yeah. That's he, a good movie. He, actually, but he yeah. wouldn't let me stay and watch it with him, which, Aww. thank God, that would have been creepy. You and your dad just being teased. <laughs> Checking for reactions. <laughs> uh, everybody that we've talked to about you says uh, you just have this mind for everything <laughs> as far as film goes, TV shows, music. And you could tell when you watch your movies uh, that y- there are these niche little quirky things that it's like, how the hell did anyone even remember that? <laughs> yeah, like when you look at it, you go, I forgot I ever knew that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I know, like a lot of people say that I know a lot of stuff about like old television stuff, but that was because I spent time sitting in front of a TV my whole youth. Yeah. You seem more proactive, like perhaps you were doing something <laughs> along with that what was what was it like growing up because obviously it affected you uh the way you, you make films well you know it's funny it's like um i just you know, uh just the way like any kid you know uh this kid like loves football and that's all he's about or this kid loves baseball or this kid loves cars and he's drawing cars all the time i was always into movies movies and t- television shows and uh that's always what i was <clears throat> really always like about i even remember if i did something good or something like that and uh my mom was going to do something nice for me you know, she'd even say, she'd say, okay, so I could take you to Magic Mountain, or I could take you to <laughs> Disneyland, or I could take you to a movie. What do you want to see? But I, I, any movie I want to see? Yeah, Blazing Saddles, because <laughs> I couldn't get into Blazing Saddles by myself. And it was like, you know, and she thought I was an idiot. But what kid 
chooses a movie. <laughs> and by the way, I go to movies every weekend, so it's not like I don't go and see them. Well, who, what kid chooses a movie over an amusement park? Well, you know, I'll see Blazing Saddles. Yeah, let's go take me take me to see Blazing. She wouldn't see that on her own. And I always picked a movie. You know, yeah. it's always what I was into. Movies were a huge part. Me growing up, I remember uh, I had a movie theater like real close to my house. And we used to walk there and see things. And you could sit there all Saturday. Oh, yeah. You'd watch the same movie. I remember, like, Kelly's Heroes yeah, 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 would yeah. be playing. And I'd just sit there and watch it, like, three times. Oh, yeah. I actually remember <laughs> when my parents would take me to the movies earlier on, or, like, my, my stepdad would take me to the movies by himself with me. And we'd go in there, and I'd, like, think, oh, you mean... The adults could just sit here, you know, and just watch. Man, when I grow up and I go, I'm going to watch the movie five times. <laughs> Especially if you like, it was like something that was really, really cool. Like it's a mad, 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 mad world. Oh yeah, oh, that was man, a great movie. I, I want to see that three times while I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen every movie? I've seen a lot of them. Like, I, 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 here's a maybe a weird question. What what's uh, a movie you've never seen that people would be surprised that you've never seen? Oh gosh, that's actually that's a good question. I mean, you go obscure, obviously, but maybe something that people would be like, Quentin hasn't seen Star Wars or or something yeah, like that. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Leonard Part Six. All right. <laughs> you know, okay, uh, I didn't see the last of the uh, Lord of the Ring movies. Oh no, kidding! Return oh. of the King, and I, but there's actually a really r good reason. I wa uh, uh, a friend of mine from uh, when I was doing Kill Bill. A friend of mine I met in China. Uh, she came out to America, uh, and uh, we saw the Two Towers movie together. And she'd read all the books like a couple of times. So when I watched the Two Towers, I enjoyed it so much more than I did the first one because she was always kind of whispering in my ear and like, well, you know, and this thing and the tree people and da 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 da. da. And, and so when the Return of the King came, I was like. I kind of want to see it with her. I don't want to see it. <laughs> right, right. And it's actually, I had, actually hadn't seen her in a couple of years. But I saw her like last week. I go, you know, I've been holding off seeing Return of the King to see it with you. She goes, okay, but we got to see the extended version. I go, okay, I'm, I'm down. But that's like, that's one that I hadn't seen. Yeah, that would be. An, I, I would figure you would have seen that one. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I like the fact that you will credit people who you feel you've been influenced by. Like you turned me on to John Woo. Oh yeah. And uh, I, this Chinese stuff he did, mm -hmm. which was you know, uh, like the Killer and, yeah. and uh, Better Tomorrow, uh, Better Tomorrow too. What was the one where he slide down the banister doing the double the chow yun fat to slide down the banister? Oh yeah, that's the uh, uh, that's very smart too. I think. Yeah. No, no, no. It's it's uh, oh, hard, boiled. hard boiled, hard boiled. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In stereo, we did. Hard yeah, it was kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Promo. Um, yeah, I would definitely. Uh, he credits people with that. All those yeah. double gunshots and the yeah. guys pointing at each other. It was just really great. Well, hard boiled has that one moment where chow yun fat gets covered with flour and then he yeah. like, just puts the gun right at the guy's face and. Bam! He shoots him off screen and then blood. <laughs> oh, 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 nice. His white face. <laughs> hey, what about movie night? Can you talk about that a little bit? I've been oh, reading about you for the last couple of weeks, and uh, movie night at your house is is supposedly just unbelievable. Oh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty. Much and and and, and will you invite us? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next time we're in L.A. <laughs> hey, you guys were in L.A., but I'd be happy to. That'd be cool. <laughs> all right, I think we'd lose our minds if we were invited to that. He has no idea that we mean it, and all of a sudden him and his friends will be there, and it's our stupid pathetic oh, face at the door. We'll, we'll have a six pack of beer. Hey, you sound, Hi, like we're here. Perfect, you sound like the perfect patron. <laughs> <laughs> but what is movie night all about? Because that's where the Grindhouse thing kind of... Yeah, it really was, actually. Came yes. from. Somewhere like around like 96 or so, I started collecting film prints. You know, it was... Um, in fact, it was funny. It's like, uh, uh, this, this shows my movie junkiness. All right, like, if you, if you throw the trajectory. Videotapes, okay, that's pot. <laughs> All right, Laserdisc and DVDs. Okay, whoa, that's cocaine. But when you start collecting prints, that's heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff's going right in your veins. <laughs> so I started collecting prints, and uh, I collect prints, you know, all kinds of different prints. But also, I do have a fondness for exploitation movies and grindhouse films, so I've been collecting those. And then I'll invite people over. I am like a frustrated theater manager. You know, the way other people invite people over and make them dinner. No, I invite you over and you, you know, show you a movie. Try to give you a good night that way. 
And so what I'll do is I'll come up with a double feature. Usually they're two movies that uh, they go well together. They can be like mine or not or in the same genre or not. And uh, But there's something that makes them work together, like a good evening. And then I, ha- I have a whole bunch of trailers. So I handpick the trailers. I take them the That's order. so cool. The order that they're going to go in. Now, usually they have some link with uh, the double feature as far as genre is concerned. Like if I'm showing two women in prison movies, I might like be women in prison trailers there. Or like they might have something to do with like uh, the different actors in the different movies. Or maybe even somebody in the audience. Okay, If you guys did a movie and I had a, a, oh, a trailer man. for it, I'd stick that in there if you guys were over. And so uh, – and so that's this, this kind of whole little perfect, uh, perfect little screening thing. And so Robert, I've been doing that for Robert for like ten years now. Not only that, I've been going to uh, Austin for about ten years, and I do a little film festival. All right, uh, it's like one, the seventh one now. And literally, we're like, you know, I bring thirty films, and they're all double features, and show them, and pick all the trailers. And so when we came up with the idea of Grindhouse, Robert goes, "This is going to be a night at, at your house, Quentin." But except we're doing it on a massive level, so we could like show you. 3,000 people in one weekend, <laughs> or 3,000 theaters in one weekend. What, here's a question I have for you, too. That I, I, what about uh, Natural Born Killers did you not like that Oliver Stone did with it? Because you wrote that, right? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, that he rewrote my script. That's mm-hmm. first, foremost, and kind of you can stop right there. Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty big problem. I mean, my whole thing about it is, like, I know people, you know, screenwriters in Hollywood, they get rewrite them all the time, and that happens all the time. Not to me. So the minute it happened, I was like, you know what? I ain't going to play this game. He didn't have a right to do it. I would rather he stole it. Right. I'd rather he had stole what he won from it just so my name wouldn't be associated with it. Was there a part of it that you hated that he did? Like the yeah, most- well, okay, there's one part. Okay, I didn't – I've never sat down and watched the movie – from beginning to end, all right. I, I went to the theaters once to see it, and then the scene that I'm going to say was so bad that I had to leave. Since then, I've like seen little bits of it on cable or something, but it was that horrible sitcom "I Love Mallory" oh, with Rodney yeah. Dangerfield. And the way it was is like you know I created these characters, and it kept a lot of my stuff. Basically, the funny what the funny stuff is still in the movie is my stuff. But um, the thing is. Uh, uh, I had position, top position on screenplay, and I would have got lots of money because that's where you get all the big royalties and all that stuff. For fear, anybody th- would think I wrote that crap. I said, take my name off the screenplay. All right, I'll get story by because I came up with the name wow. of Mickey and Mallory. I gave up money for integrity because I just didn't want anyone to think I wrote that. You didn't, you didn't, see, I like that scene. You didn't like that scene. You I hated that scene. I, but he, but here's the deal about that though. All right, it's not that like if you don't like that, if you like that movie, you're an idiot. Like a lot of people like that movie. I, I'll tell you one one time that I started feeling better about it because I didn't like it for a long time. Me and Oliver have made up though. I walked through an elevator. Elevator opens up. Johnny Cash is in the elevator. I'm like, oh, my God, Johnny Cash. So I walk in and go, oh, hey, you're Quentin Gino, aren't you? I go, uh, yes, I am. Well, me and June, we really like your movies a lot. Oh, wow, that's really great. Well, I've been a fan of yours forever. And we really like that Natural Born Killers. Oh, Jesus <laughs> so, <Christ>. so you, <laughs> so, you, know, you I took mean, the compliment that day. That went a long way, I got to say. <laughs> right? That went a long way to, you know, uh, healing, uh, healing wounds. Can, well, why don't you just remake the movie mm. you know, in your vision? You know what? It's really funny. I've actually, I actually thought about that about three years ago because... You know, uh, I actually published my screen. Now, Oliver Stone was actually kind of nice about even the fact we were fighting. Uh, he uh, he allowed me to because uh, he kind of had control over it. He allowed me to actually publish my original screenplay, so it's out there. You know, you can get my original screenplay, and it is very, very different. I thought about that about three years ago, and you know, I might still do that one of these days, but um, kind of moving forward. Yeah, kinda, that, I would. Yeah. I would really have to. Run out of ideas for a while. <laughs> Who would you have cast though, or, or did you think that the casting was done well? Uh, Woody Harrelson and Ju- uh, Juliet uh, Lewis. Would you have cast? No, I, I didn't like the casting of Woody Harrelson at all actually okay. at the time. All right, actually since then uh, we've even been feuding about. I'm not feuding, but he doesn't like me, and I don't because he knows I don't like him. Uh, but actually since then he's actually been pretty good in some movies. I thought in Ed TV he was really funny. But uh, other than that though, I wouldn't cast him in that at all. But Julia Lewis I thought was terrific. Yeah. She actually is the closest to just her performance, her vibe was closest to 
it was the closest to any vibe that I had in my script was in her performance. I thought that captured Rodney. One thing I liked about the sitcom scene, I thought it captured the real Rodney Dangerfield. Maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. But you always see him <laughs> really? being fun and stuff and yeah, easy yeah. money, but then that creepy lecherous. I'm like, I bet you that's more what he was like. Oh. like I, I thought you. Well, that's one thing about it actually that I do. I, I, as, as much as I hate that scene, that probably is closer to the real Rodney. <laughs> like I saw you in uh, uh, from Dust Till Dawn, and I'm yeah. like, I'll bet you that is closer to Tarantino than any other movie. Is that right. psychopath? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can I can go there. <laughs> you know what? Uh, a lot of people also uh, uh, talk about how you do take some actors out of yeah. obscurity and put them in there. And one that I think is, I'm amazed we hadn't seen more of this guy until you put him in movies. Uh, we remember him as uh, then came uh, Bronson, Michael Parks. Michael the Parks. Man. Michael Parks does such a good job. In Kill Bill, uh -huh. it's amazing, and playing two characters. Oh yeah, I didn't even know he was the guy oh, at the first. Pimp. The, uh, yeah, 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 the yeah. pimp. Uh, he does a great accent in that, and just his acting is is really good. Where the hell? Did you get the idea of plucking him out of wherever he was? What was he doing? Well, you know, Michael Parks has always been one of my favorite actors. I mean, he, he, nobody was as cool as Bronson. Oh, Bronson, Bronson ruled. Man. Pack on the back of his oh, bike going over that bridge. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's it, man. No, it's like, I mean, God, you know, if I was making movies back then, Michael Parks would have been the stars of them, all right? He was the man. And, um, and so I've always wanted to work with him for a long, long time. And... Uh, uh, the thing is funny is the character he plays in uh, Dust Till Dawn yeah. and the character he plays sure. in Kill it's, – it's the same guy. It's mm -hmm. the Texas Ranger Earl McGraw. And so I finally um, – we, we finally cast him, in, in me and Robert, in Dust Till Dawn, and that was the first time I'd worked with him. And it was funny because I write for Michael Parks now because, you know, I, um, most of my writing – it's supposed to be done fairly fast. It kind of has a His Girl Friday kind of pattern to mm -hmm. it, except for when Michael Parks talks. And then it's always this really slow and laconic. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Really stretched He'll kind of look off and look yeah. around, and then the rest of the line will come out. And yeah. he always, like, adds these little, like, witticisms. Of, I'm going to get higher in the Georgia pad. <laughs> I'll tell you like the Lord told John. <laughs> 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 that, that stuff's great, Mike. Put it in there. Um uh, so that was the first time, and then I put him in in, uh, in Kill Bill, playing the same guy. But I had one of these really interesting things that happened. You, you, uh, uh, to me, it's a very important day, a day when you get together and like you have a, a script reading with your cast, where everyone shows up and you sit around a table and you read the script for the first time with every, all the actors there. Now, invariably, there's always a few actors that can't make it. Now, that's okay, but in my movies, if you don't make it. Somebody else did, and I'm going to notice it. <laughs> and so I'm going to give your part to somebody else to read. And you know what? If they do, a, if I fall in love with them, you're out and they're in because they were there and you weren't. Christ, show up at Quentin's reading. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Yeah. How do you not? I know. How do you busy? What, well, what, that's, what else that's do you part have of my to point, do? All right. What else do you have to do? <laughs> One of your, you're obviously a brilliant dialogue writer. I mean, brilliant dialogue writer. Is there any piece of dialogue you can grab or like one section that you go like, that is something that I want to be on my head? Like one of the like best things you've ever written dialogue wise. Yeah, I would actually say. Oh yeah, I think hands down actually. I think the as far as especially as far as like my monologues are concerned. I mean as far as like the you know the who's on first kind of mm -hmm. back and forth thing. That's kind of that's up to y'all. They say, "Yeah, yeah, this was my favorite. That was my favorite." But as far as my monologues are concerned, I think it's the the Dennis Hopper monologue in True Romance, the Sicilians. Uh, oh my Where god, yeah. Where come from? Stop. I, that's that's <laughs> the one. That's the one to beat. That's the one I I know I haven't surpassed yet but you know I'm, I'm i'm writing a world war ii kind of dirty dozen spaghetti mm -hmm. western kind of thing and i finally have i've i got this one not scene he gives a monologue and, I, and it was the first time you know what this is as good as that i think i finally i think i finally matched it i don't know if i've topped it but i think i finally matched it but that's in this the one i'm writing now how great with dennis hopper's hand in that scene when he's just turning his hand left and right yeah, yeah. oh but what i was thinking about michael park so was mm -hmm. the, was the thing that uh you know he was there playing earl mcgraw and the guy that i had cast as the mexican pimp didn't show up so i said okay michael wow. why don't you take it and then he turned around and did it so great. And my whole thing was this, was one, he just blew us all away. And then I was like, you know what? 
I've always said that Michael Parks is one of my favorite actors. Yeah, I mean, really, in the, in, in the top. I've always said he's as good as Dustin Hoffman. He's as good as Pacino. But you know what? Let me put my money where my mouth is because you, know, you cast Dustin Hoffman to play Willie Loman. Then you're going to also pay to have him turn, you know, makeup wise and have him you know, be a, a whole other person, look, look like an old guy. You cast Al Pacino to be this far out dude, then you're going to pay the money to get the wig and all this stuff and create him to let him be that way. No one's ever done that for Michael Parks before. He's always had to just kind of be Michael Parks. Mm -hmm. So I go, well, let me. Let me spend the money. Let me spend the money. Let's get the right wig and the right this and the right that. Let's turn him into this old Mexican guy because he would be f fantastic in it. And really, it's one of the best performances I've ever in any it's of my amazing. Movies. Yeah, it's he's not Michael damn, Parks. It's one damn scene, but it actually is one of the best pieces of acting in any of my movies. Yeah, does a, an amazing job. I also have to ask you uh, because you're here. Uh, all kinds of uh, uh, things I, I couldn't find on the internet about this. The Vega Brothers. Oh, there was uh, this rumor that you were going to put out the movie The Vega Brothers about Michael Madsen and John Travolta's characters right. in some way, shape, or form. Uh, how it would be done is you know beyond me, but is there any truth to that? Well, I got to say it's, it's looking unlikely now. Yeah. All right. Um, they were supposed to be brothers? Yeah. Uh -huh. I never connected that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not. We never say it. Right. Yeah. They, they both assume. have the same last name. Yeah. One's Vincent. One's Vic. Could tell they were probably raised by the same people. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually even had a title for it. It was called Double V Vega. Uh, Double V Vega. <laughs> and it actually would have took in, uh, taken place um, during the time that Vincent was in uh, Amsterdam. When he was like running one of Marcellus's clubs in Amsterdam, and Vic goes to visit him. When Vic would be uh, Michael Madsen, and um, I, uh, we're all a little older now. Yeah. So yeah. I, uh, and since they both died, <laughs> it, it would have to be a prequel. <laughs> yeah. Then yeah. I actually came up with a way I could have done it, even with them being older and dead. Where and I'll be revealing it right now for the first time because I probably won't do it. Okay. I came up, well, they all had older brothers, and I had to have that both of the, their brothers got together because of the two guys died, and they wanted revenge or something like that. Oh, okay. But then now, now they're still too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, my girlfriend even pointed out that your violence never seems violent. Like you have this great way of not being offensive with violence. Like you, you put comedy and violence together. Like Madsen is going to set a guy on fire, and it's chilling and it's awful. And he's singing into a severed ear, and it's hilarious. He's talking to a severed ear. It's amazing how you mix comedy and violence and both work. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of it's uh, you know that's kind of actually. If, I think if you boil down uh, uh, what I'm, what, what, everything I'm trying to do, that like if you get it down to the final pearl that's left in, in the uh, in the clam, it would be uh, uh, I'm gonna make you laugh at stuff that's not funny. At the end of yeah. the day, that's the pearl that what I'm trying to do at the at the end of the day. And so the and I'm also and it's kind of almost what Grindhouse is all about is you're trying to orchestrate the audience. So it's like laugh. Laugh, laugh, stop laughing. <laughs> stop laughing, stop laughing. Um, now you're really not laughing. Laugh now. All right. And then when you feel that in the audience, you know, it's like uh, like you're a conductor. There's a there's a scene in uh, Reservoir Dogs that uh, I think is brilliant, and and uh, it's not not like a, a, a very well known scene, one of the scenes that people quote or something, but it brings the horror of what's going on with Michael Madsen and and uh, Nash inside the uh, the funeral home. Um, when he walks out to get the gas, yeah. it's just this horror going on inside. Uh -huh. And he opens the door. It's bright. You hear children playing, yeah, uh -huh. birds tweeting. And it brings the reality of it yeah. right to you because you could be standing out there. Mm -hmm. You could be playing ball or just yeah. walking in a, in a park. And yards away from you, the ultimate nightmare is going on. <laughs> and I thought that was amazing. It just brought oh. that. It made it so real. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, that is actually is one of my very favorite things about the movie is actually that that one part of that shot mm -hmm. when you because it's like it's all kind of it's unbroken for a while. Right. Yeah. And he just walks outside and it's like whoa. You haven't even 
realize how claustrophobic you'd be, you 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 become. Yeah. In there, and then it is like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah, it was like Son. a Dorothy coming out of the house, yeah. and all it's color. It's like in color actually, again. There even is, uh, and it was actually recorded in a park. There actually is, if you listen really closely, you can tell that there's like a father teaching two little kids how to play catch. You know, you hear him like, you two hands, honey, two hands. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just such a, a, a great, beautiful outside moment and just the ultimate horror going on. And, and I like I loved the fact that you hear the music and then it's off for that whole time. Right, yeah. And then yeah. Susie opens her back comes back and you're like, oh no. Video from hell. <laughs> it's like I was out of it for a minute. <laughs> well, was, oh no, I'm back. Is there anything that you would redo if you could redo it? Like that you look back on and you go, oh, I wish I had written that the way I first thought of it or I wish I had shot that the way I want. Like is there anything you look back on and you're like, ugh, I wish I had done that different? Uh, nothing nothing in a ugh kind of way. Only <laughs> The only thing is I had one really really cool little section in kill bill that uh i dropped out because i was like the damn thing was just going to be too long anyway if i had known i was going to split it in half i could have put, put it, it in, in the first half uh live and learn but it was uh it's kind of a cool character it was the fact that uh uh, uh, uh orin the character that uh lucy Liu played you know, she's the queen of the mm-hmm. you know uh, yakuza uh, one of her, like, she had just hired this guy who was, uh, uh, uh actually probably Michael Madsen might have even played him, uh, like, h- head of her security. And if, and one of the things is he doesn't wear the, the, the Lone Ranger mask. He doesn't wear the Kato mask. He has, like, a mask on a stick, <laughs> like, like, from Marie Antoinette or something. <laughs> and he's like, well, how come you wear that? That rubber band f's up my hair. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole thing is, is like, okay, she she fights the crazy eighty eight, fights them all, fights Go Go, kills her. Only one's left is this guy. His name is Mr. Barrel, <laughs> Mr. Barrel, and and Oren. And and they and the bride and Mr. Barrel have already met once. You know, in this club, and they had this little like you know flirting thing, and so um. So the thing is, like, now he's going to have to fight her, and she's like, look, I'm telling you, don't fight me. She ain't worth it. Quit. This is what you should do right now is quit. <laughs> you know, and he's, so they start talking a little bit back and forth. As opposed to fighting, they're, like, talking. They're discussing it now. And Oren's like, you idiot. Kill her. <laughs> And it's like, you idiot. <laughs> the bride is like, oh, like, oh, she didn't just say that. Oh, she, she called you an idiot in front of me? <laughs> and you're going to fight for her? <laughs> and, you know, it's like, you know what? You're right. I quit. <laughs> it just walks out. And uh, they, like, exchange a phone number or something. Wow. <laughs> hey, we got to either uh, take a break or can you hang around? What's you gotta, your schedule? I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool. Oh, Good. really? Nice. Yeah. All right, because we want to talk about Grindhouse a little bit. The phones are going nuts. The obvious question uh, everyone wants to ask is, uh, what's in the briefcase? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, keep asking. Yeah, yeah. I know, exactly. For it's 12 years, I'm going to break down to this morning. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be today. This is really cool. we got Quentin Tarantino in the studio. Grindhouse opens Friday. We'll talk about the movie a little more after the break. It's Opie and Anthony. Hear what everyone else is talking about. ONA Uncut and Live continuing the show on XM Satellite Radio starting at 9 a.m. Eastern. Visit XMRadio.com to subscribe. It's the Opie and Anthony Show. You're checking out the Opie and Anthony Show. We're talking to possibly best guest ever, Quentin Tarantino oh, it, in studio. Oh, shucks. Uh, Grindhouse opens this Friday. Jimmy and I went last night. It's, uh, he's bringing the double feature back. And during the commercial, he gave us some inside info, and I'm just blown away. It's, I it's promise amazing. I wouldn't say anything, though. Yeah, we have to keep it radio free. I had free. to find something. But maybe, <laughs> maybe like, down the road, we'll uh, talk about that. Well, there was a car scene that was shot so well that my palms were sweating watching it. It was really uncomfortable to watch this car scene, and uh, you got to go see it. Yeah, he directs the second movie. So. Yeah. We were talking about Death old proof. movies, too, that uh, kind of inspire you. Uh, Vanishing Point. Yeah. One of them. I, I thought that movie was... I just watched it recently. Uh, and uh, what a blast from the past. And I love how there was that girl 
naked on the motorcycle right, yeah, right. for apparently no reason. For no reason at all. <laughs> just down. Just right. a nude dippy. girl. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah. That's exactly what I told Anthony uh, when I came in and I, I just ranting and raving about Grindhouse. I'm like, know what he did? And I forgot all about him. I'm sitting in the theater and all of a sudden there's just uh, a girl topless. Yeah, I'm like, right. <laughs> and I still, but I used to love that about the movies. Every movie had that one girl topless yeah. for no reason, but the, the PC police took that out of movies and you brought it back with Grindhouse. Also, I'm like, yeah, cool. We, She's naked. It doesn't mean anything in the storyline, but you know what? But That's hey, awesome. who cares? Yeah, it's right? cool. It's awesome. <laughs> it's just awesome. As a guy, it's just awesome. You don't need any storyline for her to be naked. Well, you know, one of the things that was so great about Grindhouse movies is they really existed outside of Hollywood. I mean, sometimes they very much so because they were like Italian movies or Spanish movies or something. But um, the thing is... You could, you. They might be cheap. They may be this. They might be bad. You didn't, you didn't know. You, you pay your money, you take your chances. <laughs> but the, you were, you did know. You were, you had the oppor- possibility of seeing something other than a Holly you, that you wouldn't see in a Hollywood movie. Yeah. And some of those images, really, they, you know, they scarred me in a good way. But like, <laughs> they're there. Like, I can like, I, did I even see that? Is that even possible? So that was really what we were going for. But one of the things as uh, that. I have explained to Robert about Grindhouse movies is, you know, in almost every exploitation movie, just know a lesbian scene could be just right around the corner. <laughs> yes. Didn't matter what genre yes. it was, a lesbian scene could be around any corner. Didn't mean it was going to happen, but it could happen you at any know. moment. Two chicks could just strip naked and just start making out. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a little of that out of nowhere. Oh, great, and then actually, you know, in uh, right at the beginning, Robert threw it in. And, 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 and Rose McGowan's dance. You had the scene uh, where she's licking the, her own tongue in the mirror. The mirror. And it looks like two girls. Quinn, can I tell you something? I know that wasn't the movie you directed, but uh, the opening scene of this whole Grindhouse experience. Uh, I mean, guys were at the theater with uh, dates. Thank God, like I said, my girlfriend was at school. You can hear guys, like, gulping and going... <laughs> One of the hottest scenes to open up a movie. Oh, there was man. just something about that. My girlfriend was there. And, and she went, at her and you punched her in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and Rose McGowan never got uh, naked in the opening scene. Yeah. But it didn't matter. It, didn't it was matter. so erotic, and it just kicked off the whole experience nicely, man. Well, you know, it was one of those things where um, uh, people have been asking us, was there a reason why, uh, like, Robert started it and, and, and mine ended it? Ended it. Uh, <laughs> mine ended the movie. Um, and, you know, it just always kind of fell in that way. But in particular, the part of the reason was because his movie starts – with that scene, well, that's a great way to just start the night off. There you go. We're starting the <laughs> night off with a bang. And then mine ends with a car chase. So, yeah, that's the way to end it, man. Absolutely. So it was like it was a perfect ending and the perfect beginning. Greatest car crash scene to date you filmed. Oh, hey, that's a big problem, man. And, and uh, death proof. I mean, right? The car yeah, crash? We, I mean, we, you think car crash. No, he takes it to a whole new level, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> a whole new level with Tire on crashing. face, always good. <laughs> I, I couldn't get off. I was so happy. Now. I just wanted yeah. to stop the, the movie and yeah. freeze you, you, Tire on face is just always a bummer. <laughs> you cannot lose with a tire have, on the face. I have to say, I think you celebrate the car crash in your <laughs> yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, like uh, it's right on the on the, on the car crash porno <laughs> shelf. Right. I want to speak in broad strokes here, right, but yeah. you you pretty much celebrate the car crash. Pretty much, pretty much. It was a deep throat of car crash. Right. <laughs> in case you didn't see it the first time, I give you four other chances to show it to you. And the movie ends with a nice twist. I'll yeah. say that much. You nice know, it's uh, also cool. Uh, the different genres. Uh, obviously, you, you were raised not on one genre of movie. Uh, the uh, Asian movies um, with Kill Bill. A lot of people were, were a little suspect of that at first. They're like, what the hell is Quentin doing? You know, let's, uh, where's another Pulp Fiction? You know, oh, yeah. And then you came out with that. Originally, I was a little thrown by that. Uh-huh. And now, Kill Bill, both of them are like on my top movie list. Oh, I love nice. it. It took a couple of times of watching it. Yeah. Uh-huh. And now I'll whenever it's on, boom. It's, oh man. It, it's gotcha, like gotcha yeah. Scene, right? It's like yeah. there are a few movies that fall into that category, yeah. Alien, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. things like that uh, where if right. it's on, I got to watch it. That's one of them. You talking about doing a war movie. Yeah, yeah. Now that's a completely new genre yeah. uh, that people don't know you for. How, any challenges, anything uh, what what type of Quentin uh uh personality is is injected into this? Well, it's like I all my movies are like very you know even though I'm working inside a genre, all my movies are very very personal. So mm-hmm. It's gonna be a Quentin movie, all right. Um, it started off sort of like 
like a um, you know like my version of the Dirty Dozen, not not like I'm not a remake, but just you know a bunch of guys on a mission. Right. Oh, right. Those '60s war movies, bunch of guys on some suicide mission. The psycho, the rapist, the this, the that. You know, the sergeant. Those movies were great too. They would take all afternoon on a Sunday yeah. with the commercials. Kowalski. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. It would be a four or five hour movie on TV oh, on a yeah. Sunday, then, but you didn't mind. Then you had like you had the actors to do it. I mean, just think when they did the when they did the Dirty Dozen. Without even trying hard, they threw a rock on a tree and Jim Brown falls out. John Cassavetes falls out. Charles Bronson's hanging there. He falls out. Richard Jacob. We're not even talking about Lee Marvin. You don't even get to Lee Marvin. Bronson, you know, Brown, my God. So it's like, you know, they, those had the guys. Yep. So, uh, but what's, what it's become as I've been uh, writing it more and more and more is, you know, it's kind of a big sprawling epic. It's become... My spaghetti western, but with World War II iconography, which makes sense because that's the one time in the 20th century that you know really was a no man's land, especially right. if you're in Nazi occupied territory. And so, um, uh, the movie's called Inglorious Bastards, but it has a subtitle, and the subtitle to bring the spaghetti western, you know, uh, uh, aspect of it to the fore. Once upon a time in Nazi occupied France. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. You're nuts, man. I love it. <laughs> and it's uh I was I was talking about the subtleties before that I love in your movie and what, another another scene um and this was in uh, Pulp Fiction. After that whole goddamn coffee scene uh at uh, the, the, your house uh, right. the character that you played um when uh the wolf just tips his cup to you. Yeah. <laughs> God damn brilliant. It's so subtle. And that coffee scene was such a big scene. And he just acknowledges it with the little nod in the tip of the cup like, this is good. <laughs> God damn brilliant, man. Yeah, so it's an interesting character, too. Like, the wolf was such an interesting character. This guy who all these murderers respect, right. who's going to clean up this mess, is this polite cornball. Right? Yeah. <laughs> who likes a good cup of jaw. Yeah. Makes little jokes with the gal. <laughs> exactly. It's those subtleties, man, that just make it gold, man. Actually, one of my favorite little moments in there is like you have to watch it a bunch of times to catch it. Is <laughs> when the wolf is on the phone when they're calling him about going and cleaning up the mess. Seems to be at a cocktail party at seven in the morning. Right, like, right. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Which I got. You know, one of these days I got to be cool enough to have a cocktail party at seven in the morning. Seven, wear a tux. <laughs> still looks great. And uh, and he's like, you know, they're like, you know, they're, they're like, okay, so here's what happened. This has happened. This happened. So he's just making a a note. All right, of, uh, just writing down the the, the big uh, high points. So he's like, Jules, black, uh, Vincent, white, one body. No head. No head. <laughs> <laughs> His little notepad. The fact that you had uh, 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 Marcellus Wallace be raped with a ball in his mouth and somehow pull it off that he was going to win. Yeah. That's the amazing part was that not only was he brutally raped, but then he gets the line, I'm going to get medieval. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and he wins. It was it was really amazing, these yeah. character things you do. Yeah, actually, get e uh, get evil on my ass. That's my show me the money. <laughs> that's, that's my little catchphrase. I think. Yeah. Out of all of them, that's the one that kind of That's enter a good the one to have, though. Yeah. And kind of uh, uh, Bruce Willis's character yeah. was... You didn't quite see that Bruce Willis until Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And then he kind of was doing that character a little more. Before that, it was more of the, sm like, jokey, smirking kind of... Well, like Hudson Hawk. Right, know, right. Uh, kind of guy. That, yeah. and, and, and from Bruno what I've read, kind of you guy, kind of yeah. told him, I don't want to see any smirking smiles. <laughs> I don't want to see that Bruce Willis. No, but it's actually, it is, it is kind of funny. You know, Bruce really, you know, uh, yeah, that really showed him off in a, in a whole different light. Even though it actually doesn't, he's, he's not that different uh -huh. than he was from his action movies. But it actually, he kind of just acted more like... Like a cool '50s actor, right? You know, to me, he was like he reminded me of Aldo Ray, an old actor I always loved. Uh, and, uh, and Bruce Willis actually is one of those is one of the few actors who's a star that I could imagine being a star in the '50s. Mm -hmm. I could see him as a Glenn Ford, you know, kind of star. And um, but yeah, he. You know, after he did Pulp Fiction, he actually really took that ball and kind of ran with it. Then started doing other movies with other directors he admired and stuff. Yeah. And I've, I've been really proud of his career. And I'm not, I'm not going to ask you the obvious question, which I think is the hack Pulp Fiction question. Uh -huh. What's in this case? What's the gold thing in the case? Just right. leave it alone. Let it sit. <laughs> Read oh, the internet to well, figure it out. What I want to know is, did Bruce Willis's character 
key Vince's car. Oh, yes, and that's very good on your okay. part. Okay, all that's right. That's very good reading between the lines. Good, yes. good, all right. I figured that because uh, he was pissed at him. Yeah. Punchy. <laughs> Punchy. Right. That whole exchange is just great. And he kind of looks at him and you know you know he had to get yeah. back at him. Yeah, to me, like the subtext going on there is you have the two stars of the movie and they can't share a frame together. Right. Yeah. They just, they just, the minute that they actually share the same frame together, they get mad at each other. <laughs> it's like two Elvises can't meet or else, right, right. Else, you know, uh, the world stops. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant, man. And Samuel Jackson, uh, uh, the speech he put. It's amazing how many things that you do that just all of a sudden are a part of pop culture, man. I mean, that, that's probably the most famous thing he's done on film yeah. is that character, yeah. Yeah. that speech he would make. When did you know that film was going to be as huge as it uh, became? Well, you know. Because it was so much different than anything else that came out. Well, you know, it, it's actually funny because I didn't have a whole lot of perspective on it for the simple exactly. fact that it's like. You know, I made it. We showed it to a couple of audiences. I showed it to some friends. But we were rushing to get it done in time for the Cannes Film Festival. And we only, like, finished it. Like, okay, here's a print. We've got it done. Okay, I got a print we can show. Like, about, like, seven days before the festival started. So it's not like I made it and, and had, like, you know, it was, like, kind of leisurely about it. No, we had just done it. Huh. And now I go to France and I go see it at the Cannes Film Festival, really for the first time since we were done, done. And then we win the Palme d'Or. <laughs> and so then nice. I'm on the whirlwind tour on it. So it was like Amazing. really. I just finished this. Yeah, yeah it you. really did. And so like, but you know, they winning the Palme d'Or helped the movie out so much because. You know, it could have been debated. It could have been this. It could have been that. But that just and the whole violent issue that just stopped it all. I mean, we win mm -hmm. the best prize you can win in cinema. <laughs> and people were questioning uh, the casting with John Travolta because yeah, uh -huh. people, you know, it's like, oh, the the look who's talking, yeah, right, baby uh -huh. talking movie guy <laughs> is going to be in this. Uh, and uh, you know, you took him, and obviously. Uh, you you do have, like Jimmy said before, this talent of bringing stuff out of actors that no one has seen before or expects. It's and a, it's just it's it's, it's amazing. A, it's a vision because I mean that's yeah. that's taking a massive chance on on your little baby, you know. Well, you know, it's I mean it's funny. It's just like you know I'm 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 just a good caster, all right. You know, most of the. Um, but who would know John Travolta? You could. That's well, what I'm trying to say. I, I yeah. mean that you got it out of him. Well, but you know, I, I remember. I you know I I remember more than just Vinnie Barbarino. I I always thought he was fantastic. And one of my favorite movies is uh, uh, the Brian De Palma movie Blowout. I love. Mm -hmm. Blowout. Yeah, right He's on. fantastic in Blowout. You know. Yeah. I love him in that. So it's like, you know, it's like, oh, if he did that, he can do this. Nancy yeah. Allen, right? Yes, exactly. Remember after yeah. Dress to Kill, how sexy she was before oh, yeah, stupid yeah. Michael Caine tried to attack her and she fought <laughs> yeah, the whole right. thing? <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Hey, hey, what, yeah, I know, like, you know, Michael Caine ruins a perfectly good strip scene. <laughs> I can't tell you. Well, growing up on cable, I would always watch certain scenes, you know what I mean, and to to, to get, you know, to get right yeah, in yeah. to go. And uh, that was one of them. And there was a strip scene in, in Stir Crazy where there was a little ass wiggle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> was, was there also uh, another one? This is just getting my, Finally getting my curiosities uh, taken care of, a little self-serving. But uh, that scene, uh, John Travolta, Uma Thurman sitting there, and she's describing how every um, episode of her failed TV oh, yeah, series yeah, uh -huh. would end with her telling a joke. Yes. Was that an homage to Welcome Back, Cotter, where, where oh. uh, Gabe Kaplan, at the end, would tell his wife a joke Question. every time? You know, every time I watched it, I was like, see, I think he might have thrown that in as a little homage. You know, God, that, you know, uh, no, I didn't do that on purpose, but that oh, completely damn. works. <laughs> it does. That completely works. No, that to me, that was just like the kind of gimmicky thing that a female secret agent show would have. It was every and, episode uh, of Welcome uh, Back. Yeah, yeah but you're right. You're com <laughs> John never thought about that. I can't wait to uh, God damn. tell that to him. <laughs> you should lie from now on. Yeah, yeah. That was a brilliant question. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm sad to say we got to get him out of here. God, oh, Quentin. man. Best guest ever, man. This has been I mean, a this lot of so fun. Fun. I'm sorry, that's like I'm getting the vaudeville hook. I'm, I'm, yeah, right. I'm, I'm thinking we might become friends now. Yeah, I think so too. If you're, anytime you're in New York, please. Oh. You know, anytime you got uh, free reign here. Oh, you got it, man. You got. Love it. to have you let's, back. Let's give uh, Grindhouse the big plug. So it's a double feature. What do you want to say about it, Quentin? Oh man. Well, you know, the thing about it is like, you know, it's, you know, it's hard to just take the forum and just not send, just sound like you're hyping stuff up. But the one thing I can say about Grindhouse, man, you go and you pay your money, you're going to have a night out at the movies. I mean, you're not just renting a seat, 
movie's over, get the hell out. You're going to know you you saw something that night. You will talk about it. Yeah, definitely. It was a great movie, and, uh, man, thanks for coming in. You were fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, fans, my pleasure. Man. My pleasure. Love it. Right House oh, premieres man. Friday, and uh, our, our audience, is, great. for the most part, will love this yeah. movie. I mean, I know that's like just saying, you know, but we know our audience that, you know, they're going to love it. They're degenerates, and they're yeah, psychopaths. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> and that means they're my audience. They're all, they're all stuntman Mike. They're our audience. <laughs> Picture stuntman Mike, but 300 pounds with the worst mullet. <laughs> The Opie and Anthony audience must be at this theater. <laughs> well, well, yeah. But we love them. We love them. Yeah. Grindhouse opens this Friday. Quentin, this has been uh, uh, beyond a pleasure. Thank oh, you so my much. My pleasure. My pleasure. We'll continue. It's Opie and Anthony. It's the Opie and Anthony Show. Ah, good morning. <laughs> Roland just walked in and said Quentin Tarantino is a half hour late for his next uh, interview. <laughs> oh, great is that. He really was having a great time with the show today. That was a, a genuinely fun guy to talk to. Man, what a, what a blast. Guy. He's yeah. nuts. Yeah, he's a nut. He's a true cool Love him. Brilliant, brilliant guy. And that's a compliment, by the way. We like the nutty ones. Dude, he is that, all about movies. Anybody that wrote that Hopper scene, and you forget that he wrote that. Yep. It's like, th that's not coming from a place of a healthy life. <laughs> <laughs> that that moment between those two is just, you, you have to have something wrong with you to write that. It's so great. So goddamn creative. Man. We can go home now. I mean, come on. Yeah, I know, right? Let's be honest. What do you want? What do you want? Dumb dyke uh, gym teacher stories? Oh, Henry, wait for I want. <laughs> oh, my God. Come on. I want Fonzie. 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 Tomorrow. No. no. Tomorrow. You are a... How long the clip C -tees. is it? It's not even that. You want to, like, rush through the Henry Winkler Tease. 1984 child molestation uh, PSA? Oh, and you, and you had to say the whole title so oh, we all no. know what it's about. How about we give a preview? In honor yeah. of Grindhouse, we'll give a preview. A preview. Oh. A little yeah, g g of give us a little. By Come the on. way, by this time next week, I want you all to understand they have to make the movie called Thanksgiving. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. You see the movie, you'll understand Thanksgiving <laughs> must be made. <laughs> was uh, was I the only one that uh, was hoping that Quentin saw a little something in me for his next feature? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Were you the only one? This is what I said to him, and this is why he should have open handed slapped me in the face. We were talking off. off I was on. giving him profiles. I was giving him. <laughs> I was giving giving him different twinkles in the eye. I was giving him my mean look, my happy look. We were talking off, <laughs> off air in between commercial breaks, and I, and I was talking about that scene with Walken and Hopper. And I was talking about how great Walken was because <clears throat> he was laughing through most of it. Like, you'd think you have to play it angry and tough. Uh, Walken was smiling and engaging. And I'm like, you know that rope they say with actors where you have to have that tight rope in between them? I was trying to use, like, actor talk. Ugh! Yeah. Believe yeah. me, he should Stop he it. have cup slapped my face <laughs> because he recognized me from Lucky Louie when he came in. He goes, you were the pot dealer on, on, yeah. on that, you didn't know the name. He's that show on HBO, you were the pot dealer. And I'm like, yeah. But then again, he didn't offer me anything. So I'm like, all right, well, maybe not impressed, but I mean, still a nice fella, nonetheless. But a lot of people have said I should do some work with Carapino. I mean, that's just whatever. Well, of course. I've heard that. Well, I, I walk into the green room. We shouldn't. I walk into the green room. He says that uh, he's a fan of our show, and he starts rattling bits off and says, he talks about the replay that XM does. We have our own channel over there. Uh, uh, what bit did he mention when he came in here? <laughs> what was that? Boy Room Jimmy. He was that, Boy Room uh, Jimmy. No, no, I don't think it was that uh, one. Psycho Opie. No, the psycho -Opie no, thing. I don't yeah. think it was that he one. It was uh, Frank the Frowner. He laughed no, Frank no, the Frowner. No, I believe He, he loves the Tarantino. meanness that I show no. when I'm jumping on uh, cakes I of homeless people. I believe Quentin Tarantino brought <laughs> well, up well, well, the no, uh, family is. feud. No, no, no. Yes, I think it was the Louis Anderson. Not maybe in passing, but we had a whole thing going on about my participation in the Opie and Anthony show in the green room. Oh, is that it? <laughs> yeah, he, said, he goes, what does the other guy do? And then you said, he does family feud. He goes, I'll mention that because he wanted it to be balanced. Yeah. Shut up. That's exactly what happened, you know. <laughs> that, you guys well, suck. And Anthony, Quentin, between you and I, I carry him. But uh, I really would like to hear a compliment today. <laughs> when he, when, when, us. When he said Anthony selling spit, each other out. I wanted to hock a loogie on Anthony from here. <laughs> I was jealous and annoyed, but I wanted to take credit for but it. But then he said you were the... You, you oh. said that he did... T uh, I don't think it made the air. He said, you're the drug dealer from Lucky Louie. No, no, I, yeah, I, I just yeah. Said, he said that to me in the drug Yeah, room. yeah, that's what I mean, right. Yeah, but I wanted to t I wanted to take credit for that damn bit so Oh, bad. I know. The second he mentioned the uh, uh, Louie Anderson family feud bit... I knew, 
I knew Jimmy was going to jump on and say thank you. Yeah, I thought that up or something. So I instantly broke into a little bit of it. And I knew I couldn't. So Jimmy couldn't steal what it was from I me. Do? My father. I, I probably could have pulled up my father. <laughs> Used to beat me with whiskey bottles. Well, well we like, would all try those. You guys <laughs> suck. What? Everyone but, with but their look, knives out, ready to just thrust it into each other's. But backs. at least we're all acknowledging it. I, I I saw that we were all doing a little play with him. <laughs> just course. like maybe maybe this is it. Maybe this is where I get to recognize That's what I was. I'm the like, next hey, big thing in Hollywood. I grew up with a lot of TV and movies. <laughs> that was, that was and your and angle. I, I wanted to relate to him in that way. We all had different angles, and I was like, like I was brought up the same way. I know a lot about TV. All of a sudden, I was and, dramatically looking out the window, giving him a profile. I'm bringing up obscure things about <laughs> one of his most popular movies that he didn't even know. By the way, Stephen S. from Bayshore, you hear how fast we're talking right now? We're just gushing Oh, girls. we're gushing we're like girls. bitches. This is why we do radio. It's so much freaking fun. Like, like bitches. Stephen from Bayshore, hey, yo, maybe Quentin can cast you in his next marshmallow scene. Dude, I would drop my pants and do that scene <laughs> tomorrow for him. He's probably looking at you like a C. Thomas Howell. You know, blonde-haired, <laughs> good-looking. C. Thomas <laughs> Howell. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, and I'm talking about John Woo films, and he was just, he's a good to bad yeah. fan, too, man. I wish we would have talked to him about that. He's a hes a freak for that. By the way, we're getting a communique from Philly. The best thing about him going long is he was going to Preston Steve after you. <laughs> <laughs> Beat that! Yeah, well, he'll have to do a quick phoner. Yeah, a little phoner. Yeah, yeah. give him a quick hello. Uh, that'll be cute, a little five-minute phoner. Come yeah. a grindhouse real quick, and yeah, then, you yeah. know, hang up with them. They're going to, you know. He was a fun guest, man. Guy hung out for, uh, what, like an, an hour? hour? And he was a half an hour with other stuff. He did yeah. an hour with Quentin. I was having you know. a good time. Yeah. I like that. The minute you, I met him in the dressing room, or green room, you knew he was going to be a, a cool guest because he just talks. Like, he's a very cool, engaging guy, man. You knew he was going to be a fun guy to talk to. Everyone's like, Jesus, how, how does he taste? Uh, <gasps> like, if like you were in here... Know. You'd be doing the same thing. We don't pretend to be big shots. Yeah. We're three nothings. Yeah. What are you, above gushing over a guy that's made, like, a, a few of my favorite movies of all time? He wrote True Romance. He wrote uh, Reservoir Dogs and directed it in Pulp Fiction, you silly geese. Let's go to Jack in Chicago. A lot of calls coming in from Chicago now that we're live. What's I up, like Jack? that. Oh, hey, thanks for being live in Chicago. And I wanted to tell you guys, you just delivered the best radio gold Chicago's had in a long, long time. Ah, thank you, thank you sir. Maybe you thank should you. tell a friend and tell him to start listening to this program, huh? Hey, my wife called and said, listen to this other station because they were talking wife and husband bullshit crap. I said, turn on Quentin Tarantino on 105.9, baby. WCKJ in Chicago. Right. So thank you. Hey, how did Gary Meyer do yesterday? Gary Meyer was great. He actually thanked you guys right at the beginning of the show. and said, thanks oh, cool. to Monet for the, uh, for the nice intro at the beginning of their show. Right on. Cool. Yeah, uh, they brought back uh, Gary. That's uh, beyond cool. All right, Jack, thank you. Thank you, man. All right, let's go to Larry on Long Island. Larry, what's up? Larry. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> Larry. Larry. <laughs> Just want to say that uh, the last two weeks you guys have had uh, unbelievable radio shows. And... Uh, and uh, the guests have just been phenomenal. Kurt Russell, Quentin Tarantino, you guys are the best. Love you. Love the show. Jimmy, 